Welcome everyone to the Clay Seminars. I'm Linda Sorman, and I'm joining you from NYU, which is located on the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Muncie Lenape community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. New York University acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working dis to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And with me co-hosting today is Claire Toomey. Hello, um, I'm calling from London today. Um, the Clay Seminars is a collective gathering formed through the Alliance of NYU and the University of Westminster's research team at the Ceramics Research Center. We are grateful and humbled by the civic opportunity of our educational institutes to support this series. And we invite a broad gathering of artists, curators and arts organizations at all stages of their practice to join us and share in the seminar series. Thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled that you have uh, come to us today for Fragments and Dissonance. And uh, we can stop sharing that screen. Yes, and we're together here. And I am thrilled to be here with our three panelists, and I'd like to introduce them. Rose Simpson is a mixed media artist from Santa Clara Pueblo, New Mexico. Her life work is a seeking out of tools, as she says, to use the heal to use to heal the damages I have experienced as a human being of our postmodern and postcolonial era. Her work engages ceramic sculpture, metals, fashion, performance, music, installation, writing, and custom cars. Khalil Irving is an artist born in San Diego, California, drawing from internet culture as, from, in his words, an everlasting feedback loop of my experience. He collages and collapses together digital and ceramic fragments, creating intricate kinetic sculptural archives. Ramakan O.R. Wisters is an artist, in his words, making larger sculpture using shards, discarded, thrown out, dangerous, deadly, razor sharp, jagged, abandoned, eternal, worthless, marginalized, hard, unsympathetic. They represent, quote, the anxiety, anger, fear, bitterness, and hopelessness associated with white body supremacy. So it's my pleasure to be here with the three of you. When I was thinking about the theme of fragments and dissonance, you know, I was thinking over the years of the conversations that I've had with people, and they always happen in snippets as we move from place to place. Each of you has connected with me in my practice and your words and your experience as makers have really taught me and influenced the shape of conversations today and the ones that I've been having over the past years. You know, I still remember um, a dozen years ago uh, when Rose and I were teaching a class together at RISD and uh, we, you know, were talking about history, uh, we were learning techniques, I was learning so much about how to handle clay and just the way of handling material so that it's in bits, in fragments, and that fragmentation is shown and embodied through the way that um, the shards Aren't, aren't always hard. Sometimes they're soft and they're intimate and they're internal. And that is really visible and, and uh, palatable in the work of, of Khalil Irving as well. And Ramakan is the newest person that I met right on the eve of the pandemic. We had a talk uh, in a gallery and just, you know, your understanding of that embodied experience of understanding the world through parts, through the physicality and the way that you have worked with shards and fragments as part of a healing process for self, for community, uh, in both textiles and, and other materials and ceramic has really been inspiring. And walking with Khalil Irving in the streets of Alfred and just you know watching him pick up bits of paper debris and just knowing that that's going to be part of a street painting and you know printing with that material and, and being able to bring uh, immediate experience together with something that for for historical uh, time has been a way that human culture has held its history in a shard. And so when I was looking at the words that we'd each composed, we were all doing 200 to 300 words, um, I looked at what I'd written and, and refined, and then I looked back and I found this file with all the cross outs. And I thought that that is another kind of experiencing fragments. And so I'll share some of those fragments that come through, uh, not in the scripted language, but the bits that kind of uh, spill over or uh, shatter. Fragments are what can only be uttered in part. They disrupt notions of wholeness. They are not ideal. Clay, a shard, is a glitch in the system. It signifies showing breakage and fracture, the loss of function or a process gone awry. 
understanding or experience the world in and through fragments is characteristic. It's part of the diasporic experience. I, we move through unho unhomed, out of context, and perpetually reaching back to my or our origins. What does it mean to build with what is broken, incomplete, or never whole? Fragments can be something left unsaid, a half-remembered song, or a historic fact. Uh, it can be a breadcrumb trail, things that lead us to something that is unexpected. The sharp edge of a fragment offers the potential to be incisive. It might cut through the status quo. Dissonance is productive friction. As I've been listening to music, this need to sustain and explore a note out of place, to remain in a state of unresolved tension, is to break from the expected. Dissonance offers tension. It sharpens the act of listening, the way one listens, inclusive of and inviting discord and dissent. Dissonance in ceramics drives artists to confront our emotions, often our pain. And as Claire Tumia said to me, to question stories we are told about clay objects. And this makes me ask, how are shards? How is clay? How are we uh, supposed to behave? Active in each of our speakers' processes is detournement, the situationist's method of destabilizing an existing artwork through reimagining and restructuring parts. In collaborative work like this conversation today, the counterpoint to fragmentation and dissonance is collective intention. And so I'd love to invite Rose B. Simpson to share her screen and to present her, her introduction to her work and thoughts. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> it's funny that that um, you talk about our time together um, because you're one of the most influential people in the process of of finding my voice as um as um as who I am now. <laughs> you know, because my voice is always changing. But I often think about some of our conversations and how uh, inspirational you've been in my life. Um, and so I'm, I'm ever grateful. Um, <clears throat> so being a part of this conversation with everyone is really exciting. And um, as, as a little bit groggy as I am this morning, <laughs> I'm excited about our conversation. Um, I always like to start talking about my work in context. And because we're always kind of building in relationship, we don't exist in a void. Um, and so you know, I have had the privilege of, of coming from a, a very long history of ceramic artists um, and less than artists, but, but human beings who lived in an aesthetic relationship with life and spirituality um, in the Santa Clara Pueblo of Northern New Mexico. And so I live here in my ancestral homelands. This image that I'm showing you is actually on the left is my mother's work. Um, and on the right is uh, Margaret Tafoya, who is a uh, one of the most um, sort of iconic uh, traditional potters of my tribe, um, who has since passed. Um, and I wanted to show you because this is what I'm inheriting. This is the story. This is the the visual language that I'm coming from. And a lot of it is uh, has been around grace. I think um, seriousness. Um, around a really deep and thoughtful and conscious relationship with place. Um, and, and my mother um, was given clay and, and started uh, her own contemporary process of, of figurative ceramics and eventually bronze. And so thinking about um, our place um, in context in my own voice being uh, considering very deeply our relationship to all things and also our very um, important specific perspectives that were all these facets of this reality and in that and that in the facet and in that perspective of being that very singular facet of a whole um, we are doing vital work and our perspectives are, are incredibly important um, I started doing this style of building called slap slab where I threw the clay very thin and then tore it to build with it. Um, very intentionally building the framework to force myself to be very present with the process. Um, the clay is so thin that um, 
if it's too wet, it can't hold up the next layer. And if it's too dry, you can't add the next layer. Um, and so there's, there's a really um, invested and compassionate way of approaching this building style where um, I forced myself to reveal the process very clearly to myself and then to accept it, um, to find a sense of acceptance in the process itself informing the final outcome. Um, this is um, an example of two ways of building. The bottom is the coil um, style building, these faces that are not polished. They still sort of hold the, the fingerprint and the tops are the slap slab pottery and thinking about um, the vessel as nourishment, as the bringing of life, as we are um, the earth and also it that stands upon it. Um, and in that style of building, um, finding uh, grace, refining that seriousness, um, and also finding compassion for that process and acceptance for what it might end up looking like. And then um, layers of adornment. And what does that adornment look like? And how does that aesthetic transform and represent uh, uh, self-worth or even pride in that becoming in the subtleties of um, identifying self and becoming that fragment, that facet of humanity that's vital. And instead of lying to ourselves about where we are in that world of being very, very present in that process of becoming. Um, I started to adorn my pieces with more jewelry and found beads. Um, and in that is sort of a reference to resourcefulness, even the beads being bits and pieces that we find and we identify as powerful or as aesthetically empowering. Um, throughout history, humans love beads. And this is a very, it's a very innate, I think, um, part of, of, of cultural relationship. Um, and, and this was one of my very first um, experiments with slap slab. And this is more of a life-size piece that's on a welded frame. And I really feel like, in that the consciousness of building from um, our sort of truth, our complex and very multifaceted and complicated truth that the clay reads and can inform um, that emotional power, I believe. Um, and in that um, allowing it to speak in the way that it, that it, um, can inform this process um, and uh, also validate those that the those very deep internal fragmentations of ourselves. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's just a little bit of my work in relationship to this subject. <laughs> Should we switch or? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Rose. And I'll ask Khalil Irving to take the floor. Hello, thank you all for having me. My slides. Let's see, share my screen. Being asked to join today, it makes me think quite a bit about where I'm from and um, who I was born to in terms of my parentage and the lineage of ancestors that have lived before me. And most recently, all my ancestors have like collated and connected in St. Louis. This is an image of the St. Louis Arch, which is a monument that's 400 some odd feet in the air. And in the middle of it, you see the courthouse, one of the oldest buildings built in St. Louis, where historic case for Brid Scott suing for his freedom from being enslaved with him and his wife and his family. And unfortunately, we know that uh, that did not occur. And so I think about the layers of history that are social, uh, physical, and emotive uh, within uh, spaces that are occupied and the constant transformation of an architectural environment in which 
us as humans are occupying or oscillating between the spaces of the structures built around us is a is a complicated uh, it's a complicated facility that then you have to then renegotiate constantly with your senses and the other myriad of information that you're being bombarded with daily. Just to make some room, this is an image of Dred Scott uh, who died in, in the mid 19th century. And this is a sculpture of mine made in 2017. Khalil, just to interrupt for a second, there yeah. uh, we're not seeing the image just change. So oh. you might want to select the How do we do that? Maybe I'll go back. Yeah, I, I would reshare and then select your desktop maybe. So what you're seeing is what we're seeing. Okay. Let's try that. Now I got it. Now you and I'm not gonna say anything when I share the slides. How about now? We see your desktop. Okay, can you see this? That's perfect, thank you. Okay, so this is St. Louis. Now think about all the things that I've already said. This is Dred Scott, 19th century figure. Think about what I said, and then bam, this is a sculpture um, from 2017 that is combining uh, motifs from a hobbyist or a kitsch production of the Meissen blue floral iconography uh, that was made between the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And the blue floral pattern is still in production, but in a different um, set of motifs. And I'm combining that with a thin sheet of ceramic that is trying to make the, uh, the surface of that piece of clay look like newspaper. And so the, the, the issue and the problematic of understanding the things that we inherit versus the things that we're immediately interacting with or trying to decipher daily and the things that we're trying to wrestle with emotively within our sensorial engagement, it is all trying to wrap into, these, into this sculpture at once. Uh, thinking about clay as something that can occupy space as uh, being of itself, like clay looking like clay, clay being formed into a vessel and clay being formed into something that is recognizable from life, but is not necessarily going to perform or function the same ways in which those objects were or are made. And so making clay exists as those three parts of itself, those three different, uh, in some ways you could say fragments of its possibility, but also its, its uh, measure of itself uh, ex 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 making them exist simultaneously is a kind of uh, pressurized um, dissonance of people's understanding of what clay can be and what clay can do, but also uh, the possibilities of invention that can exist uh, within a material that has such a long history of being formed, but also being used as a means for industrial production, uh, the evolution of industrial application within the world, um, and and. For me, it's just been a, a, a place to put so many things uh, simultaneously in one. And so this sculpture from 2017 is a, is a kind of manifestation of this collage that I made uh, where you have Royal Delph and Meissen in the background. You have my backdrop or my, my screen uh, in the back distance. You have a, a lecture between Theastra Gates and Hamza Walker. And at this, in this screen on YouTube, they're comparing a Carrie James Marshall painting of a young man to a, a 16th century or 17th century portrait of white Jesus. And then you have on the left, you have a set of garniture. Uh, and in the bottom, you have a white supremacist uh, making a statement. And then you see it comparatively to the judgment and um, the surveying or survey ship of, of uh, black men being forced or sold into enslavement or being uh, checked and prodded for the NFL draft. And this comparative study is a way of thinking about violence against Black people in relationship to histories of, of violence, not just against Black people, but how appropriation and uh, production can exist simultaneously and still be at, someone can be at fault, but through uh, the action, it may not be uh, acknowledgeable or recognizable or um, 
decipherable, which is then a, a further fracturing and fragmentation of our perception of the life in which we're living in the built world around us. This is a collage made in 2017 for the Swedish sculptures that I made that that one sculpture is a part of the dialogue. Uh, one of the things that I wrestle with a lot in the studio and pre preparing for new projects and ideas is that first series of works that I made in 2017 were a comment on my experience in 2014 when Michael Brown was murdered in St. Louis County. I was making sculptures out of objects that were made in 2014, but then presented in 2017. And then I was using newspaper articles that oscillated between all those periods of time in one. And how does that breadth of uh, time, a fragment of time or space kind of coexist within an object that can continue to live uh, beyond me and beyond the measure of any of those incidents or occurrences that I reference or myself even living to make the thing. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll invite Ramakan to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, hopefully that, that can be seen. Hello everyone, thank you for being here. And thank you, Linda, for letting me be a part of this. It's very exciting. Um, what, I, what I found about uh, ceramics and fabric is that, um, well, first let me begin by saying what you're looking at. Let's start there. <laughs> what you're looking at are my most recent body of work called Flowered flower thorns. And what you're seeing are broken ceramics um, and uh, fabric woven into, into sculpture. I also uh, use at the very bottom here on the left, you can see some um, coffee, coffee bean bags that I have unraveled to add um, to the sculpture because uh, it's burlap. And I think of coffee bean bags as a symbol of labor because someone, someone has to go and grow those beans and someone has to go and plant and take care of those beans and harvest those beans. Um, and these are all you know, coffee, which is all black and brown uh, regions of the world that's been harvested. So I figured as a symbol of labor, I'd also add like the fabric itself, um, which is also a symbol of labor because usually fabric is made from predominantly from um, black and brown women around the world. So I owe a great deal of thanks to uh, people who have expertise uh, beyond my skills because I don't, I, don't, I don't weave nor dye my own materials. And I also am uh, grateful to uh, Tony Marsh and Christopher Miles uh, Ian Hazard Bill and Dino Capaldi uh, for allowing me to have their shards. So the whole idea of a, of a collaboration of, you know, of, of, of uh, weavers, ceramicists, and then myself to make, to make the work. So um, when it comes to the whole idea of, of, of uh, fragment and dissonance, what really resonated with me is the statement in the statement about the theme of the discussion for the seminar is experiencing the world through fragments is characteristic of the uh, uh, diasporic experience, and I live that every day. That's part of my genes. So how do I how do I create something or bring something into the world that symbolizes? I hope you can see the label. There you go. That symbolizes my experience. So. Um, when it comes to symbolic language and speaking abstractly and metaphorically, I see ceramics as a stand-in for my experience of, of being black and queer in America, broken, dis discarded, marginalized, minimized, you know, and then the fragments of the, the, the fabric and textiles. I grew up in a textile family. My father and mother both worked in a textile mill um, in North Carolina called Haynes Knit. 
um, and they used to be, they used to be in North Carolina. Now I, I think they're off they're offshore for now. And then the whole idea that everyone is wearing fabric, and fabric is more universal than any other material, in my opinion. It's particularly more more universal than oil on canvas because there are very few people that walk around wearing an, an oil painting as a as a garment, but we're all wearing fabric. So I was trying to, you know, use these two elements and to, uh, as a metaphor for the black queer experience and the African um, diasporic experience or any experience of other or otherness. That's how we're characterized by the dominant culture is to be perceived as other. So, and then um, the symbolic associations that I have with shards um, is that it is a symbol of brokenness so throughout one's life one has to accept brokenness from the minute we're born to the minute we die because we're always degrading we're always being fragmented we're always losing something just to live because our bodies are constantly aging aging and you have to experience and, and understand and, and accept what that means um, and the acknowledgement of self. So accepting fragmentation is for me a very powerful way of navigating a very hostile environment and a world. So these are all the things that I bring to the work that I create. I'm sure a lot of people when they see these images or when they see my work, particularly if there's a lot of them, they unconsciously reference brokenness. And I wanna reach people on that level of the unconscious because that's what we all are acting on whether we understand it or not, we're all driven by our unconscious, if you believe the, the science and history of psychology and uh, psychiatrists. And to tap in, not to my experience, how do I create a universal experience so other people can experience and acknowledge their own pain, their own uh, unhappiness, or whatever feelings they have about brokenness. And my whole thing is I don't throw these away. They're shards and broken, but I don't throw them away. So I keep them and I create something beautiful out of it. Otherwise, we are, we are uh, socialized to discard anything that's broken. Unless, you know, we have the skills to repair it. We're more inclined to go out and buy something else. And I'm saying, you know, if you are beautiful when you are intact and not broken, then you are beautiful when you are broken. And then let that and our power in fragmentation, I think, is what has helped people of color and marginalized and marginalized peoples around the world be able to survive in a very hostile environment. So a, a lot of these symbols, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking very personally, personally here um, in that how do I how do I um, create sculpture that can manifest people's experience beyond my own. You know, my experience and my pain is mine. How do I translate that into something beautiful? Something people can relate to, not on my experience, but on something quite universal. We all have our pain. We all have our uh, brokenness. We all feel thrown away and in, in, in an other, as an other in, in many situations throughout our lives. And then I feel as though that's something to be acknowledged, something to craft. Uh, and maintain, and also be a part of a, of a global, as an African American, queer, queer African American, is to, ex to acknowledge that my experience did not start with slavery. Black and brown people were the first. So, I, so when it comes to the history of, a, of, of, of the black experience, it's 300,000 years old. It just it did not start with the, the um, the beginning of the slave trade. And that's fragmentation because we've been fragmented and our culture is continuously being fragmented. And that's why I put these pieces and the work that I, that I create in a context that's speaking to larger, more dreamlike symbolisms and concepts. So I don't know, have I, <laughs> have I gone over my five minutes? <laughs> It's perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
you. So when we stop sharing screen, we'll be able to reconvene. And I am really moved by the resonance that happens between the conversations. You know, it started to appear as I was getting the pieces of writing, but as you speak of it today, it's just so immediate how much uh, inheritance and ancestors and lineage and also how we uh, as a group renegotiate labor. Uh, Rose brought up process and that idea of um, refining that grace through the slap slab process of making a, a physical embodiment of being very present. And I think that that opens up the question, how much does that offer that the processes that you um, gain and that you invent through your making, how does that link in with your relationship with the past and with things that want, you want to change in the future? Is this for me? I'll start with Rose, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Khalil. <laughs> I mean, oh. I'll take it if you want me to take it. Oh, it's for all of you. Go for it. Well, I, you know, in some ways, I think right now I'm I'm trying to still learn so much about some of the things that I'm doing and some like, even though I have spent many years like dealing with certain processes and practices, the how things continue to evolve and change and transform things can be done differently. So I think for me, I'm still in a state of learning um, and I'm still learning through my process and learning through the possibilities of things as um, we see like Tesla is like making the electric cars and they're using lithium in a different way. They're mining cobalt around the world and they're using uh, that to then make different things. Like how then could that also affect, I mean, that affects our prices in the, in the shop when we go to buy materials, but how does that also affect what we're able to be doing in the studio? So I think, uh, In a lot of ways, I like to just I like I'm working on making more room in the studio to be in a place to recognize all the possibilities and maybe in the near future, I'd be able to do a little bit, be a little bit more confident in some of the parts of what you're you're asking. Rose. Um, I really like seeing um, Rama Khan and Khalil's work. Um, because I, I sort of project myself into that process, like looking at the details and those, um, you know, finding, um, you know, a familiarity in that moment of, of investigation and an almost quiet or loud intuitive listening, right? In that moment of, of allowing the moment of, of questioning and then and then daring to allow um and that in itself i feel is incredibly powerful um and validating you know and to see like those details of like the spun string or or that moment of crush um and feeling that inside of myself and and the reflection of the ability to dare to do that and to make that decision uh that choosing is that uh creation right is that creating force um and i think about um the silence and innovation and how much listening it takes to allow and how much listening uh within and watching and witness and wonder in order to sort of pull those tools together to be the person that you need to be and the being that um, is brave enough to do this, you know? Um, and then seeing when, when others like Linda, um, when, when seeing that courage and that excitement, Linda reminds me of the excitement of, of, of building and that the, um, the reflection of when that piece looks back at you and you learn something. Uh, and in that learning, you realize that you're putting that out there in the world, something that never existed before, and in that's creation. Um, and those fragments, you're watching them and seeing them spin together and create this whole that is so beautiful because it's so dynamic. Um, I just think about innovation and, and how that's so linked to 
courage and intuition and the courage to look deeply at our own intuition, which is a really, really beautiful thing. And I just feel so blessed this morning to see all of your work and, and just to, to, it makes me want to get back to work, you know, <laughs> but I'm excited to talk to you about it too. Me as well. I, I, as you talk about intuition, you know, I'm thinking of something Ramakan said about um, working with the shards and how private a process that is. How um, you said, Ramakan, I don't want other eyes on this process. So when we're working with issues that are so um, uh, internal and so uh, raw, uh, can you talk a bit about what uh, what kind of uh, aesthetic grows from that like you have talked about rejecting classical beauty you know how does how does that kind of privacy um, and intuition um, then find itself in aesthetic and before you answer that Ramkan, I'd like to invite the uh, the audience listening to go to your Q&A and you're able to uh, type in questions uh, so we can open the floor up to your questions as well so the Q&A will welcome your questions at this time um, well thank you Linda the the I for me, we have to have and be courageous in our time alone to be able to, um, to have, so for my studio, it's like a sanctuary. You know, it's where I don't have to, there are no eyes. It's like, it's like being in the, in the black church where everyone in the, in the you know, the black church experience, uh, once you're able, you're able to be who you are within, that, within the church, that sacred space, because you know that once you leave that space, uh, you can't be who you are once you leave the blacks, once you leave the church. But, you know, and every, all the eyes are outside, but they're not on the inside. So you can, so you can let go of having to um, uh, decode or, or having to smile or having to, you know, uh, step and fetch or having to be, to pretend. So my studio is a sanctuary. Um, and to be, you know, I, the idea of like uh, classical, you mentioned, my, used to mention my comment about classical beauty. The classical beauty was never designed to include me. Man, my nose is too big, my lips are too thick, all that, right? My skin is too brown. Classical beauty was not designed to include me. So when it comes to me creating beauty, I need, I need to create beauty in a way that uh, subverts that type of mindset. And I can do that not when I'm being watched. <laughs> you know, I have to be, I have to be very vulnerable because of, because at the same time I'm drawn to the culture that I that I grew up in. I'm also rejecting it, and it's constantly happening because it's because it's a mirror that that the culture sees a mirror of me, and it, and it's not a mirror with a smile. So I have to be able to bring that um, uh, um, self acceptance. Of who I am and what I and my my creativity and my idea of what it is to be an artist in, in America, I have to internalize that in a positive way, and it's easier for me to do that when I'm not being watched. And I feel there's old Black America. Anyone, anyone, any culture, with, you know, that's in a a, a, a violent, a hostile environment, we're always being watched. Our ancestors are being watched, even even from the grave, they're being watched. I feel. So the whole idea of having eyes on me, I know this is a lot, this is a lot when you asked about the idea of not having people in my studio, I feel this so well. Um, when, I, when I'm working, uh, I don't, I feel this so that I, it's not personal, it's just that I feel this so that I can't be authentic if I'm always being watched. And if once I leave the studio and go out into the street, there are cameras everywhere. There are cameras that can watch us from, you know, from the sky and can also identify us from the top of our heads. So the idea of well, how can you be, how can one be authentic and courageous if we're always being watched? Um, I think that's part of your, that was part of your, your question, I think. <laughs> did, I leave, did I leave anything out? Thank you so much. No, that's, uh, it brings up so much. Would our uh, other panelists like to um, add, ask questions. Rose said, suggested going with the flow, and I love that. So as, uh, as Claire Toomey joins us now for the q and I'd also like uh, to invite the panelists to ask questions or to respond to what was just said. It's very powerful. I mean, I've been working so for many years within schools or uh, like some kind of institutional setting. 
And now I've moved home full time to St. Louis and I'm spending time building my own studio. So I don't, in some ways, you could think about being in an institution as like building an, a, a relationship, unhealthy or healthy relationship, or being dependent or independent or codependent within that space. And I've been trying to figure out what does it, well, I have had no choice to move home to St. Louis. So I, um, now, what does it mean to build a studio from the bottom up and the infrastructural things that you need to be able to survive? What can you make uh, without? And does that change the physicality or the point of departure that you can uh, engage in from a place with uh, a certain set of resources or possibilities? And does that also, does that that does that fracture away from a certain way of knowing or being also allow you a certain openness uh, to to operate in a completely different way and is there uh, something else that's born out of that and so for me a lot is being born out of being in my own space without the eyes even though when I was in teaching with Linda at Alfred University uh, you know our doors were always open for the most part and so people would see us even um, in our most vulnerable state, but in a lot of ways, I think in those rooms it was always also about sharing. Um, and I think in a in a like thinking about this place of being heard or invest like dealing with the things that we've inherited or the positions in which we're in with or without the diverse possibilities of what privilege can see or be seen as. Uh, in a place of hurt, we're also or a place of loss or lack. We're also still very giving. We're still very we're still very open uh, to the possibility of uh, positive change and growth. And and I think in in dealing with the things that I've inherited and learned from my family or society, um, and still wanting and desiring to have my own space to work on my own outside of an institutional setting, it's still very much uh, a desire there's still very much a desire to share and give uh, and the community changes the 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 context changes the fragments of what I'm working with or the parts of what I'm working with are shifting uh, the community is shifting but the the issues and the problematics that push it forward are still uh, quite similar I mean, Rose, how do you feel being living at home and building the studio and being a, like in a lot of ways I mean I don't want I mean I want to ask like are you away from other people your own age that are also invested or working through ideas or uh, construction methodologies that are similar to your own for me here in St. Louis I feel uh I feel a bit lonely because I feel like the people that I want to be in conversation with are all over the place and being here in this specific location it's very much me and my grandmother and family but it's not um, the kind of intellectual family or the material family that is so much embedded within what we know and learn as the ceramics too. I am. Um... I've been going through that loneliness, I think, recently of, um, I don't know, I think some of us choose to have a foot in a lot of different worlds. And that's like a, this fra very fragmented life, you know, um, that I speak a lot of languages, you know, um, and I have so many different communities. Um, that being like the Pueblo here in Santa Clara, even like my deep investment and involvement in car culture, that's a whole language and, and group of people that don't speak <laughs> the language we're speaking here, don't end up in these circles, don't end up in my tribal circles, you know, my, my friend groups and people, um, comrades that I met in, in school or in um, professional situations who I, I care for deeply. We're all sort of in these very, uh different trajectories and we're like these trains headed in different directions and and there is something very lonely about the investment the deep investment in your in your investigation i think but i think that when when i do connect with people that it's that it is very meaningful 
and that um, it's it, it has a deep impact. And I think all a lot of us who spent a lot of time at home for the past two years and didn't have a lot of that social engagement because we were, um, you know, uh, in quarantine, etc. That I think we got like I would speak for myself, and I hear from other people that our sensitivities got increased almost like like our 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 social sensitivity got more intense um or like you go out into the world for you know you go into the city for a couple hours and you need like a week to rest and to process what you experienced and to really deeply um revisit and understand you know the messages that were given to you in these these intense moments of connection and so i feel like being out in, in the boonies and the res sort of away from the city life and going to like, you know, coffee shops and hanging out with people that there is a, there, there becomes a, an intensity to the messages that I receive when I receive them and the connections that I have. And I'm trying not to give them a value judgment, like good or bad or, or to, to feel like a victim on a stay in my agency, you know, in my life and, and to find, um, how moments like these can really build because we're, you know, I don't think we ever weren't in a fragmented reality. I think the truth is being more unveiled more than ever. And those, those, those feelings of disconnect and um, th that the sound of, of a disharmony um, is more clear than ever. But I think it's actually, we're finding the truth of the reality of our human existence, that the denial is eroding and we're coming into a deeper awareness of of our true reality which i think is is a blessing a total blessing even in its uh in in its in its isolational loneliness yeah like a fragment of place even and i just have this image of you know what ramakan was describing being seen and observed from above from around i see this kind of 3d scan of how like you know when it gets all glitchy and there's only parts and there's parts that can't be filled in by by um, the outside those can only be um, nuanced in an internal way or in an in intuitive way claire uh, is joining us and I'd, I'd love to open the floor to questions and from claire there's, there's a really interesting question here from Abby, and um, it, it may or may not connect with this exact conversation, but it seems to, uh, I, I feel like from what you said, it will really connect in some way. She's asking um, about scale. When does a fragment become so small, uh, eroded or a granular substance, or so large, an object with a minuscule scratch or chip of its surface, to not be considered a fragment anymore. You know, when is, you know, that's, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your response to scale. Like, I mean, thinking about clay, clay is like, like a tiny, 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 like little like geometric planar form. And so it's like, layered and stacked and stacked on stacked on each other that make the material in which we can work with and i mean i feel like rose's works are 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 a larger scale representation of what clay uh particles look like so it's like i think i think it's like a a constant micro and macro viewer viewing ship of of the material but also the issue or or the 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 the, the things being mined from the earth is like a micro image or a microscopic scale of something but then how we apply it to uh like i've never been to this place but linda's been boston valley terracotta and buffalo new york you know some of the projects that they take on so they start to make the the, the architectural ornament look like scales and so how is that not a very similar form to the microscopic clay? You know, it's almost like we just like, we're in a hall, of, we're really in a hall of mirrors, it seems like, or a, a hall of, yeah, a hall of mirrors where things are, they, they are what we know them as and the way we see them as, but they're constantly um, mirroring each other, but maybe just at different sizes. I'm interested in, um and our perspective of it so like 
I think that I can feel very unified or I can feel very fragmented from, depending on my attitude. So I think like what Khalil was saying is the subject. So, you know, I think that the earth could feel fragmented from the galaxy, right? Or it can feel one of, depending on, on the perspective that you're holding the intention. So in the, in the end, it's very much intention. Uh, to me, the intention of what you're putting into it, or is it whole or is it a piece? Um, are we victims or are we um, in our agency? And for me, that goes back to your kind of call for listening as well, Rose. Very interesting, you know, the perspective of how we listen and when we listen. What, what, um... The, the idea of a fragment and the question of, you know, when is a, when is, when is a fragment no longer a fragment or when is a fragment is, is still a part of the, I mean, once something is, once something, a fragment, usually I think of, a, of a, uh, as a shard is something from something else. So if it's already, you know, um, I mean, we are, our whole bodies are full of cells that are built on top of each other. We are, there's trillions of cells but not one of them not just one does not make a human body right so the whole idea of like you know of having uh, bazillions of, of one one cell in our bodies creates the human the human being or any other object but so it can be really small or it can be really big and you can even be a, a shard of a shard <clears throat> of a shard of a shard they exist but do i but as an artist how do i what shards do i use how do i select what what's the too small or what's too big well what's too small is that if i can't get that shard to have the edges come out at the audience in a way that's dynamic it's too small you know, I have a lot of small shards here, but they don't, you know, so I, I want that tension. So that's how I select them. I have to, they, that tension has to be there. That sharp edge has to be out. That's how I feel, sharp. Thing. It has to be out. So that when you see 20, 30 shards, you know, and they're large, they're, you know, they are symbolically suggesting danger. And I think, that, and that's how I feel that even though some people may not be able to articulate it in the way that I'm expressing it, but I use shards as a way to acknowledge that there, that, that, that as an individual, I find that danger is everywhere. And now <clears throat> people are seeing danger everywhere. They're privileged of, of, of being able to be, uh, able to avoid danger because of your privileged status is no longer, no longer possible. So if an artist, so if he's asking, uh, he or she, or they are asking about how I select, which shards do I select, and how I select them as fragments, and why, that would be my answer. Thank you, Ramakan. I think that it's just really interesting, the, the kind of conversation around the question. We have, we have another question that, in a way, you, you may have answered already, but it feels like we have this opportunity in this series to think about, well, Linda and I am a little obsessed with why clay quite a lot of the time. Um, but in, in this conversation about fragments, what I, I guess I'm asking you from the question here, from, excuse me if I pronounce this badly, but Riffus, about ceramic fragments. I suppose that I'm, I'm interpreting that as a way of the materiality. Can you talk to us a little bit about the materiality of the ceramic in this idea of fragment? To me? To all of us. All of you. <laughs> starting with you, Ralph. Are you looking right at me? Uh, I am. I'm looking right You're looking at all of us in the same <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, uh. <laughs> The materiality of it. Um, I, I feel so that ceramics is, and 
I'm not ceramicist, but I but I select uh, I like the ceramics that people give me because they're they're the the material of the of the of the the material is so dynamic in a way that broken glass doesn't work in the same way. Even if it was you know, studio glass, it doesn't have the same um, uh, visceral. I mean, ceramics has this very visceral, um, you know. Just, you know, you can just tell the different, you know, it just has a whole nother, you know, and I, it's raw and it's like you, and you, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, it could be, you know, it could be, you know, like you mentioned myosin, myosin porcelain is very, porcelain is very thin. It's very difficult to, to fire as, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, but the, the materiality of porcelain is very different than, 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 the, than the type of material I'm working with. And the message is very different. I mean, porcelain is all about being refined, being elegant, you know, and myosin was used as a material for diplomacy in the, you know, with, with, with among um, uh, diplomats. So, I, so I, for me, materiality has to be a bit uh, visceral, primal, um, raw, uh, and, and clay um, and ceramics, at least the stone ceramics that I have can, 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 can imbue that so that, so that people can um, feel it. They may not be able to un understand what they're feeling, but they, but they are not allowed just to be indifferent. There's something that, this, that it has to draw them to have some feeling. To be honest, Claire, when you ask that question, I think about your big, big installation of the museum. I think, and, and how do you hold, how do you uh, kind of continue to steward those objects um, through, through the world and through, through life? And, and almost I would reply with Ramakan's answer, you know, <laughs> it's a very beautiful triangular moment because, you know, it is, about that rawness and that, you know, I have a, a, a real sense of kinship with clay and the domestic object. And uh, somebody wrote about it beautifully in one of the shattered works that I've made about, we, we associate broke, broken China with the home, good or bad, you know, it's, it's so, so, yeah. But now I'm gonna throw that question right back at you, Kyle. I, you know, I, I make everything, all the forms that are facilitated within my sculptures, I, I make them in my studio. So I'm using hobby molds um, that I've bought from different people from around the way. Um, I'm 3D printing forms to make molds of them, to cast them. I'm mixing up casting slips and slurries with like a lot of grog in it to try to make clay look like concrete and the viscerality of how I've a, a, a kind of evolved to this place has like been really interesting because it all started by making drawings of New York City in a constructed perspective in 2011. And I just see it all being like a step pyramid closer to where I've gotten to where I am. And it's never not been a part of the abstract. It's never not been the capacity of trying to decipher uh, the complicated and realities in which we're commenting on in this conversation, but then how do you put them together to make an object? The only place that, like I could also make all of my work out of bronze and I could have somebody hand paint the bronze with enamel, but the the historical significance and the problematics of the 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 architecture of what I'm doing is all having, and it's all been scaffolded uh, from the the myriad of parts of uh, what ceramics and what clay and where it comes from is and, and its applications is um, the the most important. Like it's what makes like if it wasn't for all those things, I don't necessarily think I would be making the sculpture object specifically that I'm making. And so, even though it's so specifically engaged and like 
produced in the studio. It's like I'm like a musical producer. I'm like playing with the levels and like playing with the deck board to make sure you get the whole nice sound. Uh, so when you see the object, you see in it all full. Um, but I still get that same sense of aha and like ecstatic pleasure when the kiln opens. And so the material is always, and like Rose shared earlier, it's always giving back to me that that continues to uh, make me invest more heavy in in the the viscerality of the of what the material pursuits can be. That's such a beautiful description of uh, the relationship with this material. Rose, I, I wonder, we, I think if we could push the question to you in terms of this ceramic material, and then I think Linda's gonna chuck me off because we're short on time. <laughs> um, I work with, um, you know, uh, metal and leather and uh, fabric and, um, I recently did a big piece where I cut the originals out of wood with a chainsaw, and that was a whole other way of working. <laughs> um, and, you know, more and more, I go into the studio and I, you know, I pick up the clay and I remember uh, my friend, you know, my ancestral language. And, and I think there's been times in my life where I was like, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to like exotify or objectify myself culturally into this um, a relationship with material. And, and then I go, yeah, this is this is a inherited relationship. Inheritance, it's a language. Um, I was taught to speak from a really young age and it listens. I think that I have a way of communicating and and it sounds cheesy and I've tried my life to figure out how not to make that sound cheesy because it really satisfies um you know the stereotyping of indigenous people especially um Pueblo people and you know going to study in Japan sure puts that in perspective you know that you know we actually have a very young relationship with clay in context, you know, um, but I'm still grateful for, you know, I have been thinking so much about witness and about listening and the ability to, um, to listen in a state of wonder without judgment. And I really feel that clay uh, uh, sort of teaches me it's almost like an elder and in my relationship I have to check myself and come with respect and ask in a state of you know I am a guest eternally and perpetually in this life and the clay constantly teaches me to um, remember that um, and so I feel it listens I feel it uh, hears me and when it hears me it actually documents our conversation. Uh, and when it's fired, that conversation is now an intention and investment in the future that will then be forever. That's there until it gets ground down by natural causes until it becomes sand again, but that intention becomes a part of building our entire reality. Um, and that's a lot of, and that's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of accountability and it's something that uh, we have to be careful not to be sloppy with, to be more conscious and, and thoughtful around. And I am grateful for that reminder. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you so much. That is the most beautiful way to end our conversation today. I want to thank our panelists, Rose Simpson, Khalil Irving, Ramakan O.R. Wisters, and Claire Toomey and the whole University of Westminster team um, partnering with NYU and Kevin Zhao for being our NYT technical wizard. Really appreciate all of you joining us. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Be sure to join us uh, for our next panel. And Claire is going to throw that up on the screen as we all leave. Um, but it'll be uh, the last week of June.
and we have two panels at that time. And I hope this opens up conversation for all of us as we uh, go into our lives. Um, we will be taking all the questions, everyone's screenshotted, attendees will share that with the panelists, so we'll continue our conversation in the future. Yay! Thank you. 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 Thank you.